the history of Canada, certain events are always highlighted and are well enshrined within our collective memory, be it the War of 1812, the Battle of Vimy Ridge, the creation of Canada in 1867, or the 1972 Summit Series. However, there is so much more to our history and the history of the land before Canada existed. This podcast endeavors to tell those stories, looking at chapters of our history that may be regionally well-known, but not necessarily well-known nationwide. By no means am I a historian, but I am fascinated by the history of our country, and I want to tell as many of these stories as I can. And if I can pass along my passion for the history of Canada to at least one other person, it makes this endeavor all the worthwhile for me. Welcome to Canadian History with Stephen Wilson. Now, here we are. It's the final episode of our first season where we have been looking at the American invasion of Quebec at the outset of the American Revolutionary War. The invasion carries a few important aspects. It was the first major offensive action undertaken by the Americans during that war. It was also the first time that the people whose descendants would help to create the nation of Canada told the Americans they would not join them as a sovereign nation, something that would happen more than once from 1775 until 1867. When the Americans launched that first offensive of the Revolutionary War, the invasion of Quebec in 1775, it was done so with the aim of bringing the people of Quebec onto their side. There were some initial military successes, uh, the capture of Fort St. John and then the capture of Montreal. But then things quickly went south thanks to a number of factors. Uh, Smallpox, which went through the American ranks, squabbling amongst the American leadership as there was quite a bit of friction between some of the generals. Resistance to occupation by the people of Quebec, expiring enlistments of the Continental Army, and then the arrival of British reinforcements. Oh yeah, and the fact that it was thought to be a good idea to attack Quebec City during a blizzard. Seriously, if you've ever spent any time along the St. Lawrence River during a winter storm, you would realize that that's a pretty foolish endeavor. Now, ultimately, this invasion failed, and the Americans staged a fighting retreat all the way back to Fort Ticonderoga as the British launched a counteroffensive that lasted until October of 1776. So what sort of an impact did this invasion have on not only the rest of the Revolutionary War, but the fates of Canada and the United States? Well, first is the counteroffensive itself. During the retreat, actions were taken by American General Benedict Arnold that are credited with stalling the British on their counteroffensive. The campaign ended in October of 1776 with the Battle of Valcour Island on Lake Champlain, a naval battle on that lake, which is now along the borders of what are now New York, Vermont, and Quebec. As a result of the stalling of the British Army, they were forced to go to winter quarters until 1777. Of course, the credit didn't just go to Arnold. The leader of the British forces, the governor of Quebec, Sir Guy Carleton, was criticized for his lack of aggression in the counteroffensive. There were occasions when he would have been able to capture much of the American force, including nearly all of its leadership, but he didn't press the advantage. These criticisms of Carleton would see command of the offensive in 1777 handed over to General John Burgoyne instead of being given to Carleton. The Americans didn't give up entirely on their goal to control Quebec after the failed invasion. After the American victory over the British at the Battles of Saratoga in the fall of 1777, there were a few more considerations of another invasion of Canada. Congress even approved another invasion in 1778, and command of that expedition was given to Marquis de Lafayette, hoping a French leader would be able to garner support amongst the Canadiens. A lack of supplies and recruits, along with word that the British had actually strengthened their defenses in the Quebec colonies, resulted in the campaign being abandoned. When the peace to end the Revolutionary War was negotiated in Paris in 1783, 
the Americans did demand for all of Quebec to be ceded to them. Instead, only a portion of it would be. That portion would be the Ohio Territory, which had been made a part of Quebec by the Quebec Act of 1774. So what would become of some of the major figures who were involved in the invasion? Now, we have already briefly touched on the fate of Carleton. He saw the command of the major northern expedition given to Burgoyne. This perceived slight against Carleton had him asking to be recalled as the governor of Quebec, and he returned to England in 1778. Two years afterwards, he was appointed by the British Prime Minister, Lord North, to a commission that was looking into public finances. After serving for a period in that role, he would again be sent to North America in 1782, where he served as the commander-in-chief of American forces. Now, much of the fighting was effectively over at that point, after the British defeat at Yorktown in 1781. There were still some battles occurring throughout the 13 colonies, or through the United States as they were known at that time. And Carleton would oversee the evacuation of the Loyalists to the Crown from New York City in 1783. It was during this evacuation that Carleton would become embroiled in a bit of tension with the Americans over his interpretation of the Treaty of Paris. During a meeting with George Washington, Carleton stated he would refuse to deliver over the human property, that's slaves, to the Americans at the time of the British evacuation. He noted the slaves were entitled to their freedom by British proclamation, and he instead proposed a registry to be made so that the owners could eventually be paid. Carleton pointed out that nothing could be changed if it were inconsistent with prior policies. He also noted the easiest way and fairest way for justice for everyone was to have the freedom of the slaves and the owners to be paid for it. He had a register of all the slaves who left, the Book of Negroes, that detailed their names, ages, occupations, and the names of their former masters. The Americans agreed to this, but there are no records ever showing that the owners of the slaves were ever actually paid. The actions of Carleton were not agreed with by George Washington. Washington wrote, The measure is totally different from the letter and spirit of the treaty, but waiving the specialty of the point, leaving this decision to our respective sovereigns, I find it my duty to signify my readiness in conjunction with you to enter into agreements, or take any measures which may be deemed expedient to prevent the future carrying away any Negroes or other property of the American people. Now, Around 3,000 freedmen and other loyalists left for Nova Scotia for resettlement, and some of those freedmen would later go on to Freetown, Sierra Leone, where a new colony had been established by the British. By November 28th, the evacuation was over, and Carleton departed for England on December 5th. After returning to England, Carleton would find himself being appointed as the Governor-in-Chief of British North America, while also being appointed as the governor of Quebec, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and Prince Edward Island. He arrived back in Quebec in October 1786, just two months after being named the first Baron Dorchester. Carleton would serve as governor until 1791, when he would travel to Britain to take his seat in the House of Lords. He would make one more trip to Canada in 1793 and return to England three years later. He would live until 1808, when he passed away at the age of 84. Looking now to the American side, there were a few people there who served during that Quebec invasion who would go on to make rather infamous names for themselves. The first is Benedict Arnold. That name is synonymous around the world with traitor. After the Quebec campaign, He had found himself making both friends and enemies among other officers in the Continental Army. While he had a good relationship with George Washington, Philip Schuyler, and Horatio Gates, he was nearly court-martialed over accusations from Moses Hazen, and he was accused of a number of improprieties by John Brown. Now, Arnold would be assigned the defense of Rhode Island in December of 1776, 
but was then overlooked for promotion to Major General by the Continental Congress in 1777. He would try to resign his commission twice and was refused by George Washington and was instead ordered to assist with the defense against the British at Ticonderoga. He would be wounded in the Second Battle of Saratoga after disobeying orders from Gates and spent several months recovering. Arnold was then appointed the military commander of Philadelphia in 1778, where he lived extravagantly. He would also begin to explore the options of switching sides. By 1779, Arnold was supplying information to the British and would be court-martialed on charges of profiteering. He was found not guilty of all but two minor charges, but Congress determined he owed them money stemming from expenses claimed during the invasion of Quebec. This prompted Arnold to resign his military command in Philadelphia. Arnold was then put in command of West Point in 1780, and that would be when he switched sides. After being offered £20,000 by the British, he deliberately weakened the defenses of West Point, planning to turn it over. The plot was discovered, though, and he had to hastily leave to join the other side. Arnold would serve as a brigadier general with the British up until the surrender at Yorktown in 1781. He then left for England late that year, but would find himself under criticism and unable to get any positions within the government. He would eventually move to New Brunswick in 1785, where he set up a business doing trade with the West Indies. He would again find himself embroiled in controversy, facing lawsuits and bad business deals. He was even burned in effigy by the people of St. John. Arnold returned to England in 1791, and he would serve as a privateer during the French Revolution and helped organize a militia on British-held islands in the West Indies. This earned his family a land grant of 15,000 acres near what is now Renfrew, Ontario. Arnold would eventually pass away in London, on June 14th, 1801. We mentioned the troubles that Arnold had with Moses Hazen. Hazen had moved to Quebec from Massachusetts after the Seven Years' War, where he was a land surveyor as well as a justice of the peace. He also ran into a lot of friction with his partners in business endeavors. When the war started, he originally sided with the British, but went where he thought his fortunes would best be aided, And after poor treatment by the British, who didn't trust him, he sided with the Americans. He was commissioned as a colonel after the invasion of Quebec and would lead the Continental Army's 2nd Canadian Regiment. Hazen would find himself at odds with Arnold numerous times, with a number of charges and countercharges that would lead to court-martials and other hearings. Hazen would serve with the Continental Army throughout the war, and was present at the Battle of Yorktown in 1781. Hazen would find himself unable to return to Quebec after the war. He ended up losing all of his assets there. In fact, he had pretty much invested every penny that he had in Quebec. He would also be involved in a string of lawsuits after the war. Now for some pop culture references in our look at the invasion in Canada. If it weren't for the original commander of the American forces falling ill, chances are the world would have never known the name of Alexander Hamilton, as the song from the musical proclaims. The original commander of that exhibition was Philip Schuyler, whose daughter would marry Hamilton in 1780. Schuyler had fallen ill in the early days of the campaign and had returned home. The man who took his place, General Richard Montgomery, was killed during the opening salvos of the assault on Quebec City on December 30th, 1775. If it wasn't for Schuyler returning home, Hamilton had actually paid a visit to the Schuyler residence, delivering correspondence a couple of times before officially starting to court Schuyler's daughter. But you would have to think that the two of them met uh, Schuyler, uh, or sorry, Hamilton and uh, his wife Eliza Schuyler a few times during those meetings uh, prior to their courtship that began in 1779. Now another person who factored heavily in the 2015 Broadway smash hit was Aaron Burr and he was one of the very few officers to survive the Battle of Quebec City. 
after the Revolutionary War, he decided he wasn't going to wait for it, and unseated Schuyler in the Senate in 1791. Burr would go on to finishing second to Thomas Jefferson in the 1800 presidential election and was named vice president. He would then fatally shoot Alexander Hamilton in a duel in 1804. Then Burr was charged with treason due to his very secretive affairs in 1707. He would end up moving to Europe for several years before returning to the United States in 1812. He would end up financially ruined and died at a boarding house in 1836. Now, when the Revolutionary War ended with the Treaty of Paris in 1783, Canada would become a haven for more than 50,000 Americans who would defend themselves and their children when they were called to the defense of Canada in 30 years during the War of 1812. Before we get to the War of 1812, though, we will have a special episode of the podcast next week. We will look at what many consider to be the start of the Cold War and a leading instigator of what would be called the Red Scare of the 1950s. The investigations into the incident would lead to some of the most blatant violations of rights and freedoms in Canadian history. It is the story of Igor Gazenko. His story, when first heard by many, including the police and media, was initially considered to be so outlandish that he was dismissed. That's going to be our episode next week. A few more housekeeping notes for the podcast. We are on Patreon. Tiers start out at just $1 Canadian, and you can get access to things such as ad-free episodes of the podcasts, monthly Ask Me Anything discussions, polls, merchandise, and much more. You can find the link to our Patreon in the description of this episode of the podcast on the platform you are listening to. And patrons of the podcast on Patreon will also get the chance to help choose which forks in the path we take through voting on which events will be upcoming for the podcast. We are also on YouTube. Right now you will find episodes of the podcast but there are plans to bring much more there in the coming weeks, in addition to just the weekly podcast. This includes interviews with various subject matter experts, video tours of some of the historical sites we talk about, and a whole lot more. We are also on Instagram and TikTok. You can find the links to those social media platforms on our Facebook page. On Instagram and TikTok, we will be delivering some different content on a daily basis, including a This Day in Canadian History feature. And as I mentioned, we are also on Facebook. Give us a follow there, give us some feedback on the weekly episodes, and take part in discussions about the episodes themselves. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Canadian History with Stephen Wilson.